So let's, uh, let's bow in a word of prayer before we get into today's message. Jesus, we just want to thank you, Jesus, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, you showed your light in this world, in the Gospels, God. The, the stories are written about how you influenced and impacted and, and changed the world. And Lord, this morning our hearts are yearning to, to draw closer to you, Lord. So I pray, God, this morning that as I open the word that you would speak, Lord, that your words would come clearly through, through my lips for your glory and your honor. God, that it would change us, change our perspective and change how we view you and change how we operate in, in the world that you place us in. And we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So as I uh, shared with you last week, there are no coincidences in God's kingdom plan. Both John the Baptist, his disciples, and the disciples of Jesus, they were baptizing people in the context of John chapter 3, in John. They were baptizing people with a baptism of repentance. Through this, God was preparing the ground ahead of Jesus for the work that he would accomplish near the end of his earthly ministry. And in recognition of what was taking place, before one can experience God's salvation, what was true back then is still true today. Before a person can experience true salvation through the Messiah, an individual must be willing to abandon their life of sin and willingly submit to God in a spirit of repentance in humility. Now, some people want the benefits of being saved without turning away from patterns of sinful living. And many have mistakenly thought they can come to God for salvation, they can come to Him for salvation without embracing a spirit of repentance. Christianity to such a person is kind of like an add on, it's like a crucifix that you place around your neck or a rosary to clutch, or a prayer to recite. But there is no willingness to surrender. No commitment to abandon entrenched patterns of sin before God. And this has become a pattern, particularly in our culture, where Christianity has become an add-on. But this is not the way that the Lord intended for things to work. For those who approach Christianity this way, the scriptures tell of how this is actually adulterous. It's it's sharing your life with the system and values of this world and trying to mesh that with a life uh, in service to Jesus. And it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, James, the Apostle James, says in James chapter 4, verses 4 to 10, he says to folks that are looking at their Christianity this way, he says, and it's not trite when he says this. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, if anyone Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture said, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So God says to us, he, he wants us to surrender the thrones of our heart, of our spirit, to him. This is his plan. And then, and only then, will will we realize the the salvation that God has. And as Christians, if we try, 
if we, if we backtrack and we, we backslide into a, a pattern of, of duplicity, God wants to deliver us from duplicity today to be wholeheartedly committed to him. And we need to recognize the theme of John chapter 3. Now, what we talked about last week. This passage tells us that God desires to save souls. It is not God's desire that people perish or die in their sins and that are eternally separated from Him. God desires people to rise to a new life in their spirits, to be born again. God's own life was offered as a sacrifice to make this possible. God became flesh and came to a world as our Messiah, as our Savior, our Christ. We are sinners. We are all in desperate need of salvation. But without a willingness to submit to God's holy authority, no salvation from the consequence of sin is possible. You see, it's not within ourselves to save ourselves. This is why the world needs a Savior. Why I need a Savior. Why you need a Savior. John the Baptist, his disciples, and the disciples of Jesus called people to a, a, a ceremonial washing showing that they understood their need to be cleansed from their sins, saved and delivered by God, God himself because they couldn't do it on their own. They wanted to show that their hearts were ready. They were ready to submit to God's authority over them. They were called to understand that in humility and, re and repentance, there would be salvation. So, the truth is that God calls people to humble themselves before him in this spirit of repentance. God knows our hearts. He knows our hang-ups. He knows the difficulties we have in surrendering because the flesh man is strong, wants to hold control. But he says, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord promises this. You see, you can't save yourself and you can't come to God and want to save yourself. You've got to come to God and be willing to give yourself to Him with desperation saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. Every hour I need you. I can't do this journey on my own. I can't change myself on my own. But I'm willing, Lord, to lay down my life before you. So, God knows our hearts. And he calls people regardless of their backgrounds, of the failures they've had, of their race, of their social position to salvation. He calls them to salvation. Our text today is found in John chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So at the time when people were responding to mes the message of John the Baptist and his disciples and Jesus, the, the number of people going to them drew, to Jesus, drew attention from the religious leaders of the Jews. The Pharisees learned that Jesus was gaining popularity with the crowds, so it was inevitable that they would investigate his ministry and in doing so would come into conflict with his teachings. See, Jesus was not teaching in the, in the tradition of the Pharisees of the day. They always quoted others based on the traditions of their elders. However, Jesus, Jesus was one who taught with fresh authority. He had taught message, a message and give, gave the people a message that they had never heard before. And one of the most striking features of Jesus' teaching and practice was the authority by which he taught. You see, what the people who started listening to Jesus didn't realize is that Jesus was God in the flesh. It's written in Mark chapter 1, 21 and 22. And this is an example. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he, 
because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. So he, see, Jesus understood his teaching and authority were on a collision course with the Pharisees' teaching. See, the Pharisees were proud of their positions and power over the people. They felt threatened by anyone who would challenge the traditional positions that kept them in power. They were all concerned about themselves. But they were standing in opposition to God. And and God knew that there would be an inevitable confrontation between His kingdom and the kingdom of darkness, whom the Pharisees were actually promoting. They didn't realize it. They thought they were representing God, but they were deceived. They were, they, were, they were promoting self-interest. And I've always told my children, I think I've mentioned it to you, that if you want to know what the devil's religion is, it's selfishness. That's the devil's religion, selfishness. Well, the Pharisees were selfish. They were only thinking about themselves. Now, God knew that there was going to be an inevitable confrontation with them. But Jesus decided to walk away from the fight. Now, this wasn't a cop-out. This wasn't a cop-out. God understood that it was not time for this conflict. So Jesus sidestepped the confrontation. Sometimes it's good for us to understand something about this principle. We would do well to understand. So Christ exemplified something here. It's, did you know it's sometimes God's will for us to divert away from direct conflict with ungodly people who oppose us? Did you know that? Not because we're shrinking back in fear or persecution, but because the timing for confrontation with the inevitable conflict is not right. It's not the right setting. It's not the right timing. Sometimes in gospel work, there needs to be a groundwork of things laid down in the right order through the wisdom provided by the Holy Spirit. Now, some will shrink back from speaking truth or sharing their faith with people who challenge them or confront them, and they'll do it out of fear. Now, that's not the scenario I'm referring to here today. For example, the, 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 the first martyr of the church, Stephen. Okay. Stephen was given holy boldness and courage to speak the truth even though God knew that it would result in him being killed for what he had to say. He said and he confronted and it made the people that were there very angry. And it was right. This was God's perfect timing and God used Stephen's death to accomplish other things. Conflict with the systems of this world are inevitable. And when they come to our doorstep, we should face them courageously and trust in the power of God to give us the words to say when we don't know what to say. And God will give us the strength to stand firm on the things that he desires us to stand firm on. But this being said, it seems as though some of God's people are approaching the ungodly systems that oppose them wrongly because they simply are looking for a fight. The primary purpose of standing up for what is right is to protect the innocent and is for the salvation of souls who are held captive to the devil. And this is why we must always be in sync with the peace of God over every circumstance that we find ourselves facing. Followers of Jesus must approach those who oppose them very carefully and very wisely in correct timing and in the right spirit. Sadly, there always seems to be a percentage of preachers and Christians who are on the lookout for a fight with the people who oppose them as if they were crusaders hunting down opposition to the cross. We must trust guidance from the Holy Spirit when we find opposition to the message that we present and stand for. And we must be very sensitive to the timing of God before we take stand on anything. Friends, in approaching the Lord's work of being salt and light with outsiders, as in the case of Jesus, God calls us, and I can't underemphasize this, He calls us to embrace, He calls us to embrace a spirit of wisdom. 
Trouble abounds in this world on all fronts. If you want to find trouble, it's everywhere. <laughs> we live in a world that's broken, fallen, in sin, where right is wrong and wrong is right, and white is black and black is white. We, you understand this. You live in this world. God's got a design for how he, do, he wants you to be invested in his kingdom work. See, God has a way to initiate change. And sometimes inevitable confrontation with evil, evil systems that oppose us will happen in the case of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. The apostle Peter says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be, prayer, be prepared to answer everyone who gives, asks you for a reason for the hope that you have. But to do this, but do this, sorry, with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It is also written in Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always full, be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So the sovereign knowledge of God can sometimes lead us to the most unlikely places so that we meet the most unlikely people because God, God has divine appointments that we may know nothing about at the outset. God will often desert, d uh, divert us from fruitless conflicts with our opposition that will really end up with nothing and send us to a place of fruitful ministry. Jesus being the Son of God decided that while he was in his earthly ministry, he would operate in the power of God the Holy Spirit as an example for us to follow, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came upon Jesus and remained upon him in bodily form like a dove. It says, it remained on him. Jesus chose to work in the power of the Holy Spirit to exemplify to his people how they were to operate. The sovereign knowledge of God can sometimes lead us to the most unlikely places. See, we read in... Luke 4, 16-19. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up and read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. This is what Jesus said. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set oppressed free, to proclaim, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As for Jesus, he had a ministry call to fulfill with certain people, and the Holy Spirit led him away from the Pharisees to a place where there, there was a very unlikely meeting. A very unlikely meeting. You see, God is interested in people whose hearts are searching, who are open. For it was the broken and the sick who are looking for answers that Jesus was going to focus his energies on, rather than on the proud, hardened, self-righteous Pharisees who Jesus knew would not bend to the will of God so here's where we pick up in verse 4 of John 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So this is after Jesus sidestepped the conflict with the Pharisees. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. 
Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman says, you have got nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks the wa this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming down to draw water. She had a bit of a sense of humor. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man that you are with now that you have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans wor uh, worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why, why are you talking with her? So Jesus, you see, rather than getting embroiled in a fruitless argument with the unyielding Pharisees, is directed by the Holy Spirit to travel through Demer Samaria and, and, and to sit down at Jacob's well. And when he comes to Jacob's well, the Lord had prearranged an appointment with a Samaritan woman. Jacob's well, for those of you who don't know, was the same place where Abram first came to when he entered the land of Canaan from the land of his fathers in Ur of the Chaldeans and, and that surrounding area. In Genesis 12, 7, we read Abraham then when he entered the land and was at Sychar, where this well was, he built an altar and was told by God that his offspring would inherit the land of Canaan. It was also here that Abraham's grandson, Jacob, had purchased land to dig the well that they were sitting beside, which bore his name. He purchased the well for 100 pieces of silver. And he also built an altar to the Lord in this place. Now the Samaritans, do you guys know who the Samaritans were? Most people don't. But... I'm going to give you a quick lesson on who the Samaritans were. You see, the Samaritans were half-breed Jews. Pious Jews would have nothing to do with Samaritans and would even avoid taking the road through Samaria because of them. You see, when the northern tribes of Israel were conquered by the Assyrians, in the scriptures we read about the fall of the northern tribes and their captivity and exile by the Assyrians, okay, when they were conquered and deported, the Assyrians left only the very lowest classes of the poor behind to work the land. And these people ended up intermarrying and intermingling with the Gentile Canaanite peoples that were in that area that were left there. And they ended up combining Judaism the worship of God with a lot of Canaanite superstitions. So there was this mixed blend of religious blah that they embraced. Okay? 
As a matter of fact, the, uh, in the day of Jesus, Samaritans were viewed as corrupted to the point where they were mongrels and were, were to be avoided at all costs. You see, they built a, a temple on Mount Gerizim in place of the temple that was in Jerusalem. Um, the Jews were so outraged by this that they actually stormed this temple and burned it down to the ground. And that happened in A.D. 128, before this occurrence with Jesus here. Needless to say, there were some very bad feelings between the Samaritans and the Jews. Furthermore, the person he approached was a Samaritan woman. She was getting along in age. Doesn't say how old she was, but having five husbands and the guy she was with at the time was her sixth. She was a Samaritan woman. And Jesus was breaking a cultural taboo both with race and with approaching this woman of ill repute at the well. It was obvious. Not sure how that was obvious. I mean, maybe she had attended the well for some special reason that she needed to get water in the middle of the day. But the fact is she comes in the middle of the heat of the day and, and tradition tells us that the, the, the ladies was their job to get the water for their families would come early in the morning usually to get their water. So it was an unusual time of the day for her to show up at this well. And most likely, most likely, this woman was an outcast of her own people. She's probably there at the well because she was socially disapproved of, a social outcast. Doesn't say why she was divorced or whether some of her husbands died. We don't know all of that information. But likely, see, God saw this woman's heart and how broken she was and how tired she was. In that day and age, if you were a lady and, and you were rejected by your husband and, and given a writ of divorce or whatever, um, your prospects were not that good for surviving. Um, there was no welfare system. There was no checks cut by the government to support you. You had to make it on your own. And having been married five times and having five marriages end, she kind of came to that place, I think, where what's the use? I might as well just get my bread by living with this guy. If you can picture this, right? Now, it doesn't say this is exactly what happened, but I think in the context of what we're reading here, we can, we can say this woman was desperately broken, desperately broken, living with a man in sin. No social safety nets. She, see, Jesus, Jesus has a knack for seeking out people that are broken. Why? Because when you're broken, you come to the end of yourself. And a lot of times, man's pride gets in the way of their relationship with God. I don't need God. I can do it my own way. I can make it on my own. But we don't understand as people, how really poor and broken we are. As a matter of fact, we are very tiny in comparison with God. We're just like a little flea. People that think too much of themselves really ought to examine their hearts and understand you're very small. This world if you rely on this world, it will chew you up, spit you out, and forget about you. But nobody is forgotten about by God. And this woman had an appointment with the Lord. See, Jesus always resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God often uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of those who think they are wise. The Samaritan woman was small. She was small and forgotten, but she was not forgotten by God. And God left 
the temple Pharisees and those who were the high prestigious people of that society, the intelligent um, leadership of the society, he left them to go and meet this woman in her brokenness. And here at Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman was met by the Lord's grace. And she immediately, when Jesus converses with her, takes the conversation to the conflict of racial tensions between her people and the Jewish people. And don't you love how the Lord responds? <laughs> Basically, he tells her that he's sorting out the mess. Jesus prophetically states that the day is coming and has now come that people will not need to worship God at a certain holy place, a temple, a synagogue, a church, building. A time has coming and has now come that those who approach God will be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. These are the kind of worshipers the Lord desires. Those whose hearts are open to Him, who are willing to repent and admit that they can't do it on their own, that they need a Savior. They humble themselves and come before the Lord and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need your grace. I'm not good enough to do this on my own. I know I've tried and I've failed and I can't make it on my own. I need you, Lord. I need you every hour. I need you. Please have mercy upon me, son of David. Have mercy upon me, Jesus. See, that's the Lord Jesus approaches this Samaritan woman and when he explains this to the woman. She says, she says, I know that when the Messiah comes, I'm confused right now is really what she's saying. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain all these things and make sense of it all. And at this, Jesus, Jesus reveals to the woman who he is. He says, he there and then declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The woman was leveled. She was shocked and she was excited. The disciples came on the scene and see the end of this conversation and they're kind of oblivious to what's going on. But she's so excited that she just leaves her water jar at the well and goes into town to tell everybody about what happened. It says in verse 28, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know anything about. You know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Well, could someone have maybe brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so the sower and the reaper may be glad together. His disciples didn't realize it. In the midst of the forbidden land, the land of outcasts, the land of Samaria, Jesus is saying, open your eyes. See the harvest is ripe. Look at all these people that are broken and are needing a Savior. I am here that they could have life and have life abundantly. Do you not see the harvest that is ready? That is ripe. So folks, don't be surprised. As ambassadors of Christ who are saved by Jesus, that you're going to be sent into a broken world, a world of outcasts, a place where people need, desperately need, to see the Savior's hand reach in. And you are God's ambassadors. And the Holy Spirit desires to speak in and through you to a lost and dying people. Church is not all about gathering in this building just so we can get buffeted and feel good about ourselves when we go home. It's a place where we're prepared to do the work of our Father. Our Father desires that we go into the highways and the byways of the life that He's given us to live and that we share the gospel of good news to every person regardless of their social status, regardless of how they've been rejected, regardless of how their lives appear on the outside. God has a plan to save, deliver, and heal people and He desires you to be involved in His work. 
in the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of that power. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. You see, God understood the hardness of the Pharisee's heart and he walked away. He didn't waste his time bantering about some political thing. He saw the need of the people that were dying in sin and he went to them and met them where they were. My friends, we get caught in a Christian context and a culture. We need to have our eyes open to the fields that are white unto harvest. The Lord is calling us. Calling us. You may not realize it, but God, if your heart is open to the Lord, He will lead you into appointments, special appointments with people that you have no previous understanding you're supposed to meet with. God is bigger than your mind, and He is able to lead you in the Spirit to the places where you need to be. Don't be surprised that God takes you to the doorstep of someone that is broken, that is searching, that is ripe to hear about the gospel. Don't be surprised. So when the Samaritans came to him, verse 40, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because what you said we have now heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Don't underestimate the God who has saved you and who indwells you, Christian. Don't underestimate. Don't be afraid. Step out in faith. Trust the Lord and share your testimony with someone because God will lead you to a place that you need to be. And when you share the gospel, that is a seed planted, a seed watered, or, some, or a harvest that he wants you to be involved in. He doesn't need you, but he wants you to work with him. He wants you to walk alongside him. See, Jesus has answers for this world today. I was just amazed. I actually had to renew my qualifications for shooting as a police officer. For those of you who don't know, I am a part-time police officer. I do their evidence. But I still have police officer status. So I had to, I had to do uh, my shooting to, to keep my police ticket. So I was on the range. And one of the firearms instructors starts going off about uh, how he wants us to to do a certain drill a certain way and he starts to curse. And as he's cursing, he looks over at me and he stops in his tracks. And he goes, oh, I'm really sorry, Pastor. <laughs> you know, this man is loved by Jesus. This man has a heart that needs to hear gospel both in the way that we carry ourselves and through these lips. I know for a fact that other brothers in Christ that are police officers have ministered to this man. You don't know where you are going and, 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 and the places you are, what God is planning on doing through you. You don't necessarily know that, but trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and He will make your path straight. He will lead you to the people that you need to be with. And that changes from day to day. Folks, that's what the woman at the well story is all about. Jesus sets the example and shares with us how God ministers and touches the right people at the right time in the right way, in an appointment that he's preordained. Amen. Would you bow in prayer? Jesus, we, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, for loving us, for sending us. We thank you for rescuing us when we were broken and downtrodden and a needing of a Savior, you came, you saw where we were, 
in the filth that we were in, and you picked us up out of the mire, and you set our feet upon the rock. You cleansed us. You saved us. You filled us. You commissioned us. Lord, Father, we want to do what you want us to do. Lord, we're tired of, of, not, of not being obedient. Help us to be submitted to you, Lord, and lead us to the people that you desire us to minister to. Make appointments through your Spirit, Lord. Make appointments with every person in this place that is a believer today. And for those who are here today, Lord, that are not, have never submitted their lives to you, I pray that today would be the day that they come to know that they are loved, that they come to know that there is a God in heaven who sees them, who knows everything about them, and who desires to save them and rescue them from their life of despair and darkness. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, or if you're listening online to this message, you don't know Jesus, bow in your heart before him. And by heart, I mean your spirit inside. Bow before him and call out on him and say, Jesus, save me. I recognize I'm a sinner. Save me by your grace, O oh God. Have mercy upon me. I know that you are the creator of all things, but I need you, Lord. Thank you for dying for my sin and dying instead of me as the Lamb of God. I ask you, Lord, to take away my sin and to make your home in me that I might live for you and that I might walk in eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Or if there's someone that you know, that you came here with, that you know walks with Jesus, you need to talk with them.